Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Logistics Executive TV Leadership Series. Today, I'm joined by a gentleman who is based in Sydney currently, but has worked right throughout the, the APAC region in particular and is currently in a serious uh, role with the advisory and restructuring with an organisation in, in throughout Australia in the APAC region called uh, McGrath Nickel. And uh, joined today by Ryan Stevens. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate the opportunity, Kim. Good to, good to chat again. Thanks. So we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, the pressures and challenges being faced by supply chain and logistics organisations, drawing on your expertise about some of the uh, the bigger challenges currently being faced over the last two or three years, but specifically now as we go into this new economic cycle in uh, in Australia and pretty much globally as well, to one degree or another. Um, talk about some of those challenges and some of the solutions. In particular, your organisation, you specifically are involved in turnarounds, um, a lot of activity in Australia recently in this space. So maybe you can talk to us some of the macro pressures that are coming on in the in the economy affecting logistics and supply chain, some of those solutions. Yeah, happy to, mate. Um, look, it's interesting, actually, as you mentioned, McGraw Nickel, without doing a sales pitch, you know, we do a bit of everything, right? So we've got the restructuring side of the business, which is more distressed. We've got the M&A side of the business, which is, you know, more, you know, free money, private equity, family office, big corporates, although now there is an element of distressed M&A. And then you've got the forensic side, which is a lot of kind of counter foreign intelligence, national security, infrastructure type legislation, which again goes right across the supply chain space. So we kind of see it from all avenues. Um I think interesting from our point of view is we've seen an uptick, to answer your question, we've seen a bit of an uptick in the restructuring side of the business, which by default suggests that you know supply chain companies and even the supply chain customers, retailers, corporates, et cetera, are definitely feeling the pinch. It's interesting to note that a lot of the conversations coming in the budget season, people seem to suggest that COVID is behind us and therefore budgeting should be a little bit easier going forward. Um, I would say that's not the case. I mean, COVID, you know, was sure a once in a lifetime type disruption, but, you know, by the time you've got blockades, geopolitical issues, you know, national security issues, industrial action, you know, like we're seeing at the moment in the States, or, you know, blockades in the, you know, if it comes to geopolitical again, or even military, mate, there's issues, you know, across the board. So budgeting becomes tough. And this time around, you know, cash is difficult to come by. So budgeting, especially working capital and balance sheet budgeting, we're seeing a lot more effort, you know, almost as much as p and budgeting. Okay. Good stuff. Well, thanks for that bit of an insight. You guys uh, deal with a lot of, uh, is it turnarounds, but identifying distress in organisations, organisations that are, that are under pressure from these various uh, elements that are, that are occurring from a macro and more micro. But if we talk about micro and we talk about internally within an organisation, what are the sort of signs that, that company leaders should look at within organisations to understand that they may need to take some action to, to rectify issues or to, to reset and uh, recalibrate the organisation? It is kind of funny, right? Even though I'm not an accountant, we seem to have this conversation every five years as the cycle comes around. Cash is now king. Liquidity is, is absolutely critical. You know, funding gaps, as we call them, especially in supply chain, where you've got you know supply chain leaders who are paying truckies or disbursements on you know one day, seven day terms, but then themselves are getting paid in thirty or sixty day terms, or even sixty days end a month. You know, you have this what we call funding gap, funding gap, and that funding gap can be a length of time to get the cash, but B, now just the increased cost of that cash and working capital in general. So cash at the moment, if you aren't doing EBITDA to cash bridges, you know, you really are missing the opportunity. Um, and from an internal point of view, I'd say cyber. We're seeing a lot of work at the moment on, on procurement probity um, around whether people are taking kickbacks, you know, as suppliers have changed over the last couple of years and things are getting tight. Suppliers are looking for, you know, opportunistic ways to get in, so to speak. So procurement yeah. probity is a big one. And even just cyber and, and a lot of the cyber stuff we do, we find that a lot of the leaks or a lot of the gaps actually start from within or, or even even more risky. Some of the, the gaps and, and the kind of entrance come through one of your supplier bases or what we would call your counterparties. So, you know, at that sure. C-suite, at that board level, there's definitely a lot of focus on cyber. There's definitely a lot of focus on national security legislation and counter-foreign intelligence, and there's definitely a lot of focus on working capital, as there should be. Okay. I don't know whether it's because I follow the Australian media, radio, and, and, and news uh, papers online pretty regularly, but there's been a number of fairly large institutional attacks in terms of cyber 
um, in banks, insurance companies, uh, Australia, I think one today, uh, in, a, in a major consulting firm. Is it is is it prevalent, more prevalent, these attacks in Australia, or are you seeing this right across the, the APAC region and your connections around the world? Yeah, look, there's probably better people than me to talk to that within our firm, so I don't want to you know, go too much off tune, but they're definitely more reported incidents is probably the right way to put it. Um, yeah. Some of that's about mandatory reporting, whereas, you know, historically it might have happened and you might have swept it under the carpet. Um, I think there's a definitely a lot more attention now because we're seeing mum and dads get hit with cyber and that then kind of, when they hear about it in the B2B arena, they take more notice. But yeah, some of the big names you've mentioned, and again, one today without naming names, that they're top end of town. So I think the yeah. historical viewpoint that the smaller you know, firms that aren't investing in cyber or, or, or foreign interference, you know, are the ones that are getting hit. We're now seeing it's definitely coming in at all avenues, all avenues and even in the public sector. So, um, again, government is legislating some of the things that have to be done in that space. National infrastructure is legislating some of the things that have to be done in that space. And the ramifications for the, some of these firms who may be expelled from future public service, you know, engagements is, is enormous. So the ROI on cyber at the moment is massive and there's an overlap now between what I would call cyber, national security and supply chain. Sure. In terms of cyber as a, as a risk without drilling down too far on it, um, are you finding the organisations, I mean, you guys consult right across um, right across the supply chain space and, and a lot of the big logistics companies in the APAC region, are you finding that that risk management is, is capable of being – sorted out and, and being managed internally, or is this external expertise mainly required in the space? Combination, again, depending on the size of firm and, and the size of, I guess, your internal risk committee or, or, your, or your risk you know, FTEs. What we are seeing, though, is in the deal space, especially in the M&A space, which I never thought we'd see, but cyber DD is now becoming a real thing. And cyber yeah. and risk more generally um, ahead of a deal completion is now becoming something that can absolutely shred value if it's not done correctly. So you have the normal finance DD, you have your operational due diligence and now cyber due diligence and even ESG to an element or to an extent is becoming you know part of the valuation equation pre-completion. It's, it's quite yeah. interesting. Okay. So if we talk about, just before we wrap up, uh, M&A, uh, you touched on it before uh, in terms of uh, rash, some organisations rationalising others in a, in a growth phase. Um, what are the key elements that organisations should think about in regards whether buying or selling some of the key key decisions they need to make inside as a board, as an organisation, leaders inside of an organisation? Say, for example, they're, if they're looking at growth, uh, what are the things they should be looking at in terms of making acquisitions and assessing potential buy targets? Yeah, the M&A space is interesting. So even though we're seeing the restructuring and that distress side of the business really uptick, which you would normally see a counter-cyclical downturn in M&A, there is still money out there, especially for good assets that may have had a poor balance sheet. And I know that sounds strange, but you can have very well-run businesses that just happen to run out of liquidity, and they're the ones that private equity and you know some of the big corporates are looking at. We're also seeing a massive uptick in private equity portfolio. You know, having a look at their portfolio and working out which ones to keep, which ones to divest, and, and or a combination. So I think the M and A space is still alive, and and we're extremely busy. What we are seeing is a lot more activity in what we would call valuations. So you know, two years ago, people were paying probably overs in terms of multiples, be it EBITDA or even EBIT. Um, now they're definitely being a lot more refined in what that valuation should look like. As I said, cyber is now becoming an element of that, and the deals are taking a little bit longer to close as, as DD takes a little bit longer. Then on the other side of the deal, we're seeing a lot more activity in firms doing performance improvement, synergy realisation, putting the organisations together to try and get that business case probably earlier than they would have historically. Historically, they might have done a deal, let it sit for six to 12 months. Now they're definitely getting in there early because they have to realise, you know, potentially the multiples they've paid in, a, in an economy that's you know definitely down trading from a consumer point of view. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Um, just before we wrap up then, um, maybe a couple of tips from you for, say, mid to, to medium-sized organisations across logistics supply chain space, irrespective of which country they're operating in. What should leadership be looking at in terms of fitness of the organisation? It's a little bit uh, leading question is how long is a piece of string, but some of the key things leaders should be looking at in the organisation to ensure over the next 
six to 12 months and how that plays out, how the fitness of the organisation, how to monitor how the organisation is going. Any particular areas they should be focused on in these current times? Yeah, look, I think there is. There's the usual, you know, operating performance and other KPIs being met. There's the non-negotiable safety and environmental elements that, you know, boards are now heavily involved in as our government. But I think probably coming back to the first question around liquidity, you know, potential downturns in the economy, cash is king. Now's the time, and I see it quite weak in a lot of supply chain organisation. Now is the time to get a very, very strong financial capability, be it a financial controller or a CFO. Um, historically, you've got very, very strong operational people, and you might have a an accountant that's come through the ranks of mum and dad's you know small trucking business. Potentially now the business has outgrown that, and some of the compliance regulations have outgrown that individual as well. So having strength and bench strength in the finance space is critical. Uh, and the other one we're seeing a lot of is succession planning. So a lot of, as you would know, Kim, you, you're closer to this. Uh, a lot of you know trucking organisations, logistics and distribution organisations are hitting that you know mid sixties age for patriarchs and matriarchs. A lot of the you know sons and daughters are refusing to come through, and COVID's been extremely tough on some of these organisations in terms of long hours. Uh, and we're seeing succession as a real issue, where people that just burnt out, they're happy to get out at the moment, uh, and or. Uh, they haven't really got anyone behind them to take over. So succession planning and financial, you know, strength, I think, are critical for the next six to twelve months. Yeah, I mean, since you mentioned that, what we've noticed lately is is a little bit of a gap in the middle. A lot of baby boomers are heading off into retirement. Um, a lot of new people have been attracted into the uh, logistics and supply chain space through the, the, a lot of layoffs in the tech space, and there's a big demand for tech capable and knowledgeable people right throughout supply chain. And that was brought on partly by the huge e-commerce boom, as we know, during the COVID period. Um, we've seen a bit of a gap in the middle. I mean, uh, what's your, we've had a couple of people on the show lately talking about uh, utilisation of, of uh, older groups of people who would normally be heading off, men and women who'd be heading off into retirement have been retained in organisation and a little bit more advisory role. What's your view of that? I'm 100% in favour. So, you know, I've got a couple of grey hairs myself, as do you, Kim. Um, I think, you know, bandwidth, street credibility, a couple of battle scars, especially heading into some difficult headwinds, they're some of the best resources you can have. You know, with procurement coming back, the whole e-commerce thing is still in the background, but really the wave has kind of been and gone. You've now got a lot of pressure on inventory, working capital, skew rationalisation, procurement, Stuff that was really, really important, you know, probably 20 years ago, and those skills are absolutely valid today. So you can't really put a, I don't think you can put a time or a retirement on some of those broadband supply chain skills. So 100% for it. Okay. Well, a bit of encouragement there for those of our audience who are heading, uh, potentially thinking about retirement. Uh, a lot of organizations that we're seeing, smart organizations from our perspective, are really drawing on uh, not necessarily full time, but uh, advisory uh, input and coaching input from people, as you say, who have got the battle scars and have been around. Hey, Ryan, been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, how do people get hold of you, Ryan, if they want a bit of an input from you? I know you're always happy to give a bit of advice. Yeah, look, always happy to have a chat, jump on a call, jump on an email, whatever. I mean, you can find me at the mcgrahnickel.com website, which I'm sure Kim can put up, um, or, or just reach out to me at my email, which, again, Kim can put up. So lovely to talk to anyone. Ryan, uh, thanks so much for joining us again. Um, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think some of the stuff that you're talking about is is worthy of having another look at in, in say, three to six months just to see things uh, how things are going. Uh, Ryan, thanks for joining us. You're a partner at uh, McGrath Nickel, and uh, great to talk to you. Thanks so much for thanks joining again. us. Thanks, okay. Cam. Cheers. Thanks, Ryan.